Well, here is the follow-up or companion uh, vignette on the nomenclature for partial thickness tears as part of the Pomerantz Mentor series. Let's return to a little more complex anatomy now. Looking at a simple diagram, anterior on the viewer's right, posterior on the viewer's left, we see the supraspinatus, SS, in red, the infraspinatus in blue, and the teres minor in green. Only three components of the multifaceted rotator cuff complex. The supraspinatus is more anterior, the infraspinatus more posterior, and the teres minor postero inferior. Their footprints are on the superior, middle, and inferior facet of the humerus. The footprints of each individual varies, just like your fingerprint varies. The amount of interdigitation between these vary. Sometimes the infraspinatus has a very far anterior extension that produces dramatic interdigitation between the tendons. Another caveat. Between the bulk of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus is a fibroelastic membrane, only a few millimeters in anteroposterior dimension. This is known as the posterior rotator interval. Where is the anterior rotator interval? Well, it's the space between the supraspinatus and the not displayed subscapularis. There's also another interval, the postero inferior interval between the infraspinatus and teres minor. We'll see later on that stretching of the interval, separation of the interval with actual tears may occur. Let's look down for a moment from the top down at the humeral head. Just to get you oriented, this would be anterior, posterior, lateral or peripheral, and medial towards the midline of the body. Traditionally, we have looked at the supraspinatus footprint seen here in red as inserting on the anterior humerus greater tuberosity to superior facet with the infraspinatus on the middle facet, more posterior to it. But in many patients, the infraspinatus has a much broader and more anterior footprint, and the supraspinatus with a smaller or interdigitated footprint, and some of the supraspinatus may even insert along the superior aspect of the lesser tuberosity, which forms the inner wall of the bicipital groove. These are only two of the concepts and variations that you may see. Remember, the footprint of these structures is unique to each individual, much like your thumbprint is. Let's take one other advanced anatomic concept. You've heard about the posterior interval, the posterior inferior interval between groups of muscle bundles. And you also heard about the anterior interval. It is the space between the supraspinatus and the subscapularis. It's found anteriorly. Let's get you oriented. Here's the humeral head. This would be superior or craniad, inferior or caudad. Anterior, posterior. So we've magnified this small anterosuperior area, coursing through this fibroelastic interval is the biceps tendon as it makes its arcuate descent from the superior tubercle of the glenoid to leave the joint. It is secured in this interval by a thick fibroelastic condensed structure called the caracohumeral ligament, depicted here in green. It is also supported along its undersurface for much of its more peripheral location by the superior glenohumeral ligament but much more on this anatomy in a later vignette. The take-home message for right now 
is that the coracohumeral ligament, a broad fibroelastic membrane, sends fibers along the most antero-inferior surface of the supraspinatus tendon, and these two will blend together. So the coracohumeral ligament, the green color, is part of the rotator cuff complex, and it's not uncommon for tears to begin right here and then proceed either superiorly into the supraspinatus or inferiorly into other structures. Let's continue on now with some more advanced shoulder theory. You've heard about the muscles, the tendons, the myotendinous unit, and then the thickened, condensed fibrotic cable of variable thickness. Then the crescent, which we've drawn as a straight structure purely for educational purposes, even though it's more arcuate in shape. And the eventual insertion or footprint or foot plate on the humerus greater tuberosity. The size and dominance and thickness of the cable versus the crescent, the ratio of these two, will determine what type of retracted tear you see. And when you look from the top down, many have described the shape of these tears as either crescenteric, U-shape, or L-shape. The shape will depend on whether a shoulder is cable or crescent dominant. In a cable dominant scenario, because the cable is thick and strong and fibrotic and restricts motion, there is less retraction. In a crescent dominant shoulder, where the cable is thinner, there will be a greater degree of retraction and you are more likely to see a deeper U-shaped tear. Here is an example of a patient who has a tear that is visible from the top down. The tear has a curvilinear configuration but is not yet retracted. In a cable dominant scenario, the retraction will be more dramatic and will have the shape of a U when you look from the top down. In a crescent dominated scenario, the retraction will be less. It'll look more like this. So it'll have a crescenteric shape. And we'll show you what we mean when we look from the top down in three dimensions. Occasionally the tear will only hit one part of the cuff, either the far anterior or the far posterior part of the cuff. And when you look from the top down, the shape of the tear will appear as an L or as a reverse L. So here are the three basic shapes looking from the top down. The anteroposterior dimension is depicted from side to side. So this would be anterior, posterior, anterior, posterior, anterior, posterior. The medial lateral or retraction dimension is illustrated on our crescent-shaped tear, less retraction, cable dominant. The U-shaped tear, greater retraction, crescent dominant. And then the L-shaped tear, involving only part of the tendon. Let's have a look in three dimensions, looking on FOSS at the rotator cuff. In the cable dominant cuff, where there is restriction of motion and supportive fibrotic thick material, the retraction is less, the tear is more crescenteric, and the depth, or said another way, the amount of retraction is limited. A few fibers will tether the cuff in the front and may tether the cuff in the back to create this crescent shape. In the cable non-dominant scenario, or the crescent dominant scenario, there is less restriction, the retraction is greater or deeper, and it creates the shape of a U. In the L-shaped tear, this may continue on anteriorly and take the entire cuff, but spare the back of the cuff. 
So the L would be here, and the tear would continue straight on down, making the letter L lying on its side. This concludes our initial discussion of advanced rotator cuff descriptors, for it gets you ready for some of the unique names that we're about to use, like the concealed interstitial delamination, the paint lesion, the Stoss lesion, the Rimrent lesion, the cystic tear, the sentinel tear, all coming to a theater near you in the next vignette. Thank you.